Welcome to the final segment of the week of Fault Lines on 105.5 FM in Washington, D.C. Dr. Shiva I Adore, it appears. She's a um uh she's a GOP candidate if in for Senate in well she's gonna tell us. Dr. Well, Shiva in Massachusetts, right? He, oh my gosh, I'm messing this all up. Yeah, it's what are you he, doing, Garland? Hey. He. How are you, Dr. Shiva? <laughs> I'm doing good. How are you? Wonderful, wonderful. So, so I understand you. What's so? What state are you running for Senate? In Massachusetts. That's right. And you were, and you were. By the way, that's and you're running as a Republican, which must be a lot of fun, right? That's already an uphill battle, correct? Well, you got to understand. You know, the uh, I think what's emerging in the country is people don't care about Republicans or Democrats anymore. People are recognizing both parties are corrupt. And they're both, uh, you know, two heads of the same serpent. You know, you have to run on Channel 7 or Channel 9. That's what these parties are. And the issue what people are looking at is what does a person stand for? And the politics I stand for are anti-establishment, recognizing that both of these parties are made up of career politicians who don't really care about anything having to do with the American people. It's a complete rigged system. We're not only eviscerating Elizabeth Warren, who is the fake Indian, and, you know, part of it is I'm the real Indian running against the fake Indian. Oh, that's great. The I love that. Part, that's fantastic. Yeah the, yeah, the other part of it is that also the Republican establishment, as we're noticing, is in collusion with the Democrats. We live in a, you know, the, career, uh, the, uh, the founders of this country never envisioned career politicians. You were supposed to have a job and go back to work. You know, my entire life is, you know, I've held a job since I was 14 years old, went to MIT, four degrees, including my PhD, started seven companies. I've actually created lots and lots of jobs in Massachusetts. None of these politicians know how to fix anything or create jobs. And that's beyond Republican or Democrat. It's beyond left or right, liberal or conservative. It's the fact of being an American. Uh, we need to vote out every career politician. I don't care if they're Republican or Democrat. They serve nobody but themselves. Well, so, let, let, there's a few things about your resume that I think are very counter in, uh, narrative here. For instance, you're an immigrant, correct? Yep. I'm an immigrant. Came here when I was seven years old. Came from uh, a, a, in, in India, which had a caste system where we were considered low caste, untouchables or deplorables. So the fact that my parents even made it here is one in 10 trillion. I uh, went through the entire process. You know, my person, we had to wait about a year in line, you know, to legally immigrate to this country. Now, so when so you... The whole notion... Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say, so when you... So your family immigrated here legally... When you see yep. people who are coming here illegally, who are jumping the line, how does that does how does that and, and when they're when they're associated with you, when they try to lump all immigrants, legal and immigrant, legal and illegal into the same category, I, I'm just curious about how you that makes you feel. Well, from my standpoint, if you don't have legal immigration and you don't have secure borders, you don't have a country. Look, I'm a biologist by training. Every nature, the grand designer and the grand architect of everything, puts borders around everything. You know, the cell wall, uh, you know, around plant cells or the cell membrane around human cells, you know, has a wall. It protects what comes in and what goes out. The atmosphere is a wall. So anyone who has a brain knows that you need to have borders. Otherwise, you don't have a country. So I don't even know why this discussion is taking place. And the only reason it's taking place is because certain people are profiting from illegal immigrants. They're actually exploiting these people on many levels for low-cost labor, and they're using them as a voting block. And they're, in many ways, they claim that they want to help the small guy. They're actually helping big, big corporate corporates who are essentially profiting from paying these people nothing, while at the same time suppressing uh, the advancement of American labor to, to create skilled jobs here. So it's all very closely interconnected to support the advancement of large corporations and big money, globalist and imperialist interests. So, Dr. Shiva, um, well, here's an 80 slow clap for that whole thing. <laughs> that was fantastic, Dr. Iadori. That was great. Thank so, you. So, uh, 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 Dr. Shiva Garland Nixon from the left here. Dr. You know, I adore, his first name's Shiva. So, what what should I call him, Dr. Dr. Iadori? Right. You're gonna, no, you can just call me Shiva. There we go. Shiva. Shiva there we go. Shiva. That's good. Shiva's and fine. and you know, in the yeah. interest of transparency, By and the I think Shiva for Senate. Yeah. Okay. And 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 see, in the interest yeah. of transparency, you know, Lee and I, he's on the right, I'm on the left, so we have a great discussion, and I appreciate you coming on here. And in the interest of transparency, you know, I. I'm a big uh, Elizabeth Beth Warren fan regarding her policies towards Wall Street. But I think you kind of mirror me in, 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 in one way, and that's this. 
I say I'm a Democrat, and I'll often say marginally a Democrat because I am so upset with it sounds to me like the same establishment status quo um, that, you know, I don't think you're happy with on both sides of the aisle. It's funny well, that you said, you know, the, the Republicans are in collusion with Democrats and then people like me say the Democrats are in recruit collusion with Republicans. But it sounds like there are a lot of people on both sides of the aisle that see this big status quo establishment that people are unhappy with. Are you kind of there or am I off key with that? Yeah, well, 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 look, I've been a student of political history all my life coming from a you know background of where you had to fight for your basic rights. So look, one of the things people need to understand is we need to get away from these slogans, left and right, liberal and conservative. It's all a camouflage. What we need to recognize, if you look at the arc of human history, there's always been the establishment which wants to protect its interests. And then on the other side are the change agents. Everyday people on the streets, whatever you want to call them, Tea Party, Green Party, whatever, that they're fighting for a right, civil rights movements, the right for women's rights. And then there's something even more insidious, what I call the not so obvious establishment. They use the words like revolution and fight, hope, change, but they're the, they're the other face of the establishment and they exist to manipulate the change agents so they get off the streets and come back into the establishment. Let me give you an example. You look at this past election, right? Who did you have? You had Hillary Clinton, all supported by Romney, by Obama, by the Bushes. She was the epitome of the establishment. On the other extreme, you had everyday people. And whether you like him or not, Donald Trump was an agent of change, a, a necessary disruption. And then in the midst of that, the not so obvious establishment was Bernie Sanders. He talked a good game, used the word of revolution. And as, same as Elizabeth Warren, they used the word of fight. But they're essentially, at the end of the day, he gave all of his votes to Hillary Clinton. Same thing Jesse Jackson did in 1984. So these people basically are the real insidious people because the establishment uses them to manipulate the masses so they don't take matters into their own hands, stay independent and fight for their rights. And that's what's really going on. Same thing occurred in India. You had British colonialism. You had everyday people who wanted to kick out the British, and then they brought in Gandhi. This has been the recurrent aspect of political history. And so the real issue is forget left and right. What we need to start doing is recognizing that there's the establishment and there's the people and there's truth and lies. Elizabeth Warren is a fake fighter. She's a fake Indian and doesn't give a damn about the people. She's actually helped destroy 1,200 community banks, bol bolstered Wall Street, bolstered big pharma, bolstered big hospitals. And she has nothing to do with the people. I'm actually a man of the people. I come, I'm a minority. I've worked hard all my life. I didn't lie to get into MIT. She did. So we need to get across from left and right, Republican, Democrat. It's all complete, excuse my word, BS. We're talking to Dr. Shiva at Adore. Well, say your last name, so I just want to get it straight. It's, it, it, imagine how you say, I adore you. So it's I adore. I adore. Okay, that's a, that's a good way to do it. I'm sure you've never had to pronounce your name before for people. I'm sure that's... Uh, not really. <laughs> so then that, that, that gives an obvious question, because you sound like a lot of people I know are uh, frustrated with the two-party system, et cetera. But then that comes back to an obvious question. And I'm not saying this accusatory in anything. I'm just saying this purely as a, with a big question mark, um, because I see it happen with Democrat people who are very, very angry at the Democratic Party. And then they run as a Democrat and people say, well, why don't you run as an independent or a green or whatever? So why is your choice to run as a member of the Republican Party as opposed to, you know, a libertarian or whatever else, other options or independent well, or whatever? Because I, I have great regard. Look, I never voted in my life. After I saw Jesse Jackson sell out the people in 84, I, I, I realized the Democrats and Republicans are the same. But when I saw Donald Trump run and he was using that platform as a national, whatever you want to call him, as a figure, public figure, That's to right. eviscerate the mainstream media, I thought this was great. So I registered as an independent. I voted. And then I went to his inauguration. I decided I was going to run as a Republican against Warren. Look, when I think about Republicans, I think about, you know, Lincoln. OK, there was a time when there were statesmen. But the reality is I've gotten so much brand equity, you know, building our own campaign. If the Republicans don't t treat me right, I will go as an independent. I'm not beholden to these establishment Republicans. I have recognized in Massachusetts they run a rigged system, how you get on the ballot. They screwed over previous Republicans, so they are a rigged system. So they better watch out because uh, I'll make them my enemy also because they're, they, they also may be the enemy of the people, which it appears. Well, no, Ultimately, and I, 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 having done some of these state races, I agree with you. And But by the way, I agree with you. You, you want to start by going within 
there's two parties that hold political power in this country, the Republicans and the Democrats. If you can do it through those parties, it's much easier. If you can't do it, I agree with you. And let me ask you a real, we're going to hold you through the break. Let me ask you a real softball question as a setup. You're running in Massachusetts. Are you a Red Sox fan, sir? Yeah, I like the Red Sox. There we go. <laughs> that no, was an easy know, one. I grew, up in, I grew up in New York, you know, so I also like the Yankees. So okay, no, watch it. I'm, I, no, be, be very careful. But, but I stopped watching the Yankees after, you know, like 1978. So, okay, that's good. That's fine. Right we'll, answer. Yeah. We'll leave it at that. Yeah, don't don't mention yeah. I'm just going to give you, here's a little political advice, sir. Don't mention yeah. like the Yankees. <laughs> just don't. Just leave it be. But yeah. you were endorsed by my friend Kurt Schilling, a guy who I admire. I don't know if you, uh, Tr- Kurt's also very tall. I don't know if you know that. But he's, yeah, I've seen him. Yeah. He's very big. He's but, uh, but yeah. Kurt, but, but your endorsement by Kurt says a lot because Kurt's a real independent thinker as well. And obviously, Kurt's a guy who I tell him all the time, I will clean his car or mow his lawn since I'm a lifelong Red Sox fan and he broke the curse. He was one of the people who broke the curse. But listen, we, we want to have you on after we got to do a short break, cover headlines. Then we'll have you back. We're talking to Dr. Shiva Iadorie. Iadore. He Even though he helped me, I'm having trouble with it. But my name's Stranahan. Great guest. We'll have more. Most disruptive radio show in America. It's Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. I, one of the things I love about your resume, and by the way, you're a fantastic, passionate advocate for these issues. But I want to talk about another thing that I think is very counterintuitive to a lot of people. We're told that Republicans hate science. And let me just ask you, with your four degrees from MIT, and as a biologist, why do, why do, do you hate science, sir? No, I don't hate science. I'm, I'm an inventor, a scientist, I, uh, I'm, and an engineer. So I'm a complete student of science and engineering. I mean, I went to the number one school in the world in science and engineering. Not only got one degree, but four. So obviously, I, I'm completely, you know, I, I used to teach at MIT. You well, know, so I've taught it, engineering it, classes. You, so but but, you, but you, hear, in, you hear Republicans smear it all the time as anti-science, correct? Well, I, I think what's happening is... Uh, the elites, right? Yep. Uh, want to create a framework of what they believe is truth, of what they believe is science. So take take something like uh, Monsanto or GMOs and climate change. Yes. Here's a very interesting issue. The left may love me because I was the first guy to expose that Monsanto is destroying the planet, um, that genetically engineered foods have no safety assessment standards. I was a scientist who broke uh, all of the science up by writing five major science papers while the liberal elite scientists keep, including Bill Gates, whoever you want to do, keep promoting the fact that all the poor people in the world ge- need genetically engineered food, which is a lie, and it's pay to play science. So places like MIT and Harvard get funded by Monsanto. These are liberal institutions to support this lie. Yet a lot of the lefties and the liberals eat organic food. They do yoga and they don't like Monsanto. So on one hand, people say, wow, Shiva is a great scientist. He's against Monsanto. On the flip side, I've also used science to show that the Paris Accords are complete nonsense, that the Paris Accords have nothing to do with science, meaning that it has nothing to do with defraying pollution. What it has to do with is actually enabling George Bush, the Bushes, and the uh, Gores to get really wealthy on this bogus thing called the carbon tax. And so- uh, I've been able to expose both. You see, so is that a left issue? Is that a right issue? But the fundamental issue, it's using science for mankind, which is to expose truth. Well, you know, it's, uh, on the left here, I'll certainly go along with you and argue that the, cli- the, that the Paris Accord doesn't do nearly enough to address climate change. But my, let, let, me ask you, let me ask you a question about— um, But you hear he's a scientist yes, saying yes. this, Garland. Yeah. Because you're trying to bring up the scientific— uh, No, what I'm saying is that Paris, if we want to solve pollution— you need innovation. Right. Um, the Paris Accord right. allowed China to go from 11 billion carbon tons to 22 billion. That has nothing to do with reducing pollution. And then after 2030, then the carbon tax kicks in, and that's when Al Gore and his buddies become trillionaires. That and has she, nothing to do with science. And Shiva, I think you probably know this, but when I've covered rural America, or what the left derisively refers to as flyover country, when I go into rural America, when I go in, whether it's southwest Georgia or Twin Falls, Idaho, or wherever. When I talk to farmers, you know what they think of Monsanto, right, Shiva? You know what they think of Monsanto. 
They don't like them. <laughs> well, so the other uh, so that they're, they're with you on that. They're, yeah, they're yeah. And it, well, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they hold they they hold a gun to them. That's Monsanto right. Monsanto yeah. has made seeds a software business. They have to license them every year. They're and and more importantly, from everyone listening, you know that company's uh, pesticide glyphosate has been proven now to cause ultra low levels of fatty liver ultra low levels of their pesticide cause fatty liver disease which is the onset of diabetes, uh, obesity, et cetera. So, and yet, if you look left and right, all of these guys get paid by Monsanto in the Senate and in the House. Right. Uh, 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 corruption. It's certainly, um, you know, there's two discussions when it comes to climate change, and one is the background and policy, and the actual, the other side is certainly the the facts on the ground of what's really happening when it comes to the issues of climate change and the, and the changes um, that are happening in our atmosphere. But there's a, a, an issue I think that is near and dear to everyone that I want to ask you your position on, and that is, and this is probably where to me there's the most when it comes to the working class people on the street, left and right, where I think probably we're looking at more. Um, uh, more of an accord on that. And that is, what is your position on uh, foreign wars? And do you believe that President Trump was correct in sending more troops to Afghanistan? Okay, so let's talk about the first part of your question. First of all, uh, in 1961, when Eisenhower, one of the great generals, exited from his tenure, he gave a very famous speech where he told Americans, and he's a Republican, about the threat of the military-industrial complex. Do you remember that? By the way, the speech actually said military-industrial-academic complex. The science advisor, who I believe at that time was the president of MIT, removed the word academic. A few years later, in 1970, uh, Senator Fulbright called it the military-industrial-academic complex, the triangle which profits from war. So we need to look at uh, the fact that as a nation, we need to protect our borders, we need to strengthen our people, but going and fighting wars where Hillary Clinton and Sidney Blumenthal make money by ousting Gaddafi, going into Iraq, which we didn't need to go into when there were fake WMDs, didn't even exist. Um, all of these are wars driven by the military industrial complex, which profits from it. Yes, are, do we need to go fight certain wars? Yeah, but I can tell you that most of the poor whites, poor blacks, poor Hispanics who we've sent to fight for these wars did not need to die. They died for wealth, minerals, and profit for the few. What so, about uh, Af Afghanistan? Rel rel yes, relative to Afghanistan, when you really look at Afghanistan, that was a war we got into, right? And if you actually look at it, there was a major pipeline that needed to be built, and you can go look at the concomitancy of us entering that war and how that pipeline got built for Chevron, et cetera. The other piece of that is, you know, is it a coincidence that after 9-11, after we went into Afghanistan, that heroin sales have skyrocketed and when they were actually plummeting? We have to recognize that we are peasants in a much larger game where the world is actually moved by weapons and drugs. And that game is something that most of us are not privy to. And I can just tell you that there's layers among layers on this that when it comes to any war, we should all be questioning, are we really protecting our borders or who are we actually fighting for? And that's a question that people who are sending their kids or the people who are going to war shouldn't ask themselves. Well, Shiva, I really because look many of these wars are not fought for the interests of the American people. I can give you an example. You know, I spoke at the Boston Free Speech Rally, 40 of us against 40,000 people. I was called a Nazi and a white supremacist. Uh, the Cape Cod Republican Club a few weeks later said, Shiva, we don't want you coming here to speak. We're afraid BLM and Antifa will show up. Uh, they, these are the most wealthiest of the wealthiest Republicans. You know, they will drape the red, white and blue when they send, you know, our uh, sons and daughters to go fight their wars. And they'll talk about and you know, we're fighting for the Constitution. But in their own neighborhood, they're afraid of Antifa and they won't stand up for the First Amendment. So these guys are hypocrites. So I don't trust most of these people when they say we should go go to this country and bomb them or fight for them. We're just fighting for their their wealth. We're not fighting for American people. Complete nonsense. Well, let me let me keep this to Massachusetts for a second, because I grew up in yep. Massachusetts. I grew up near Spring. I grew up in East Long Meadow near Springfield, Western Mass. And yep. uh, again, so I'm 52 now. I left Massachusetts around the time I was. I left permanently was around 20. So it's been 30 years, but I go, I go back periodically and it is tragic to see what's happened to Springfield. For instance, Springfield, the crime has gone way up. These are, these are working class areas, right? 
And and I don't have to tell you that, you know, again, a lot of people, when they think of Massachusetts, they think of they really think of Boston. They don't think of the rest of the state. They don't think of Worcester. They don't they, they don't think of Springfield. They don't think of Pittsfield. They don't, right. So when you see these working class towns across Massachusetts. How does what how, are you thinking of them when you're running? Do you what's your plan? Oh, yeah. To look, revitalize look, those I, areas. I, look, I consider myself a blue, high tech blue collar worker. MIT is a Votech school, high tech Votech school. I can build things. I, can, I still write my own software. I can fix my car. I'm not a, you know, I write well, but you're not talking to a liberal arts guy who manipulates people and moves money around. Um, so you're talking to people, you know, I grew up in New Jersey and Patterson and Clifton. My grandparents were farmers. You're talking to someone who came from nothing. So when I look at everyday working people, they've been eviscerated by both parties because in Massachusetts, for example, for every 17 skilled job openings, guess how many people are actually skilled to take on those jobs? So it's not like we don't have, we have a dearth of jobs. We actually have a lot of jobs. Only one person is skilled to take on 17 uh, openings, one to 17 ratio. And these are jobs that are electricians, plumbers, uh, you know, cytotechs, uh, x-ray techs. They're good paying jobs. What we've done is Boston, as you say, has become sort of this um, hallmark of education. We bring in a lot of people from all over the world, but we've destroyed the, the uh, educational base of skilled employees all across the state. Our people are not ready for the 21st century. And what we've done is we've brought in illegal immigrants, we exploit and suppress them. And then at the same time, we suppress the indigenous labor. Put two Votex schools, two or three Votex schools in Springfield. We need to teach people basic education. You know, they don't, we don't need to go to college anymore. The MIT's education is available online right now for free. We need to get back to skills training. Well, let me ask you this too, especially especially since you you, you came from India, your your family immigrated here from India. How much of a factor do you think this H one B visa program is? Where, as you know, a lot. Oh, we need to get rid of the H one B. Yeah, we and... need to get rid of it. Look, I'm telling you, as someone who recognizes, look, what what people don't. I have a very different perspective on it. You know, India. Uh, when we left India, it was a very corrupt nation. And what the H-1B and these visas did was they removed the best minds out of India. My parents worked, uh, worked really hard. They were the creme de la creme. They got to come here. But in some ways, I would argue, because America had merit-based immigration then, so they, wa- they needed high-tech workers like my parents. So, oh. But what happened was we left India with, in many ways, not the best people. Had the best mind stayed in India, maybe they would have revolted and fought against their own governments uh, and brought something better to India, much better. So I would argue what we're doing is we're bringing in people from other countries to is a Band-Aid solution to not address the fact that we've destroyed the infrastructure of this country. We don't have good schools in this country in the inner cities. So what we do is we bring in immigrants as a, as a, quick, fix, as a quick fix solution. When what we should be doing is investing in schools and uh, better infrastructure in this own country. A uh, uh, question about um, uh, 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 of one particular demographic. So we're going into 2018, uh, we're moving into the first um, voting uh, election cycle where millennials will uh, technically be the largest um, uh, um, block of potential voters, whether or not they all show up, but there'll be a huge block. And one of the issues that is near and dear to, to, to them is the issue of, you know, the cost of college, college student loans, things of that nature. There have been people talking about, you know, free college or dealing with student loans or doing something. Do you have anything on your platform in any way that you think addresses um, the issue, the crisis that the millennials are going through with student loans? Or do you feel that that's something that the government shouldn't be involved in? What's your position on that? So here's here's my issue on it. Look, we need to eliminate all student loans, get rid of all of them. Let me tell you why. Student loans is a misnomer. The student never gets the loan. The money goes from Sally Mae right to the uh, to, to the institution. There is no market forces telling the institution to lower tuition costs. They just keep cranking them up. The kid gets admitted. The parents say, OK, you got to get a loan. That's what's actually going on. These kids are leaving with, even in a state college, third, like UMass Boston, we have a volunteer working for us, great kid, $30,000 loans. Private institutions, $50,000, $100,000 loans. And what kind of education are they really getting? Well, many of them can't even write an email well. They don't know how to talk to customers. 
they don't really have major skills. So they have these loans and they're living in their parents' basements. We need to get rid of all student loans. Students need to work and study. And how did they go? Maybe that begs the obvious question. If there are no student loans and the kids, uh, you know, that you're a student, you want to go to college and let's face it, you're not going to pay for college working at, you know, McDonald's or whatever. How, what is there? Do you say replace that with anything with anything or is there something that should be done? Or do you just say, is your position just get rid of them? Period. No, no, you get rid of students. Look, I, as an employer, you know, uh, I'll give you an institution. Northeastern has a great co-op program. I never hired any of the uh, kids from the Ivies. They were always very entitled. They think they knew anything. But the Northeastern kids were working class kids. They come, they work hard, and they left with great skills. We need to get back to hard work. We have people, millennials, thinking they know everything. They don't know everything. Their parents have, in some ways, betrayed them by denying them the importance of working hard, excellence. These things are missing now in that set of kids, and we're setting them up for failure. So when I hire people, I've had to now do the work of what the schools didn't do and what the parents didn't do. And that's what's unfortunate in America right now. When I was a kid growing up in New Jersey, I had landscaping jobs. I was, you know, I mowed lawns. People I worked for taught me the value of work. And we've taken that away from these millennials. And when you and when you talk oh, about this, going to college. And when you talk about necessary. this, you know, I mentioned Western Massachusetts. When you look at the five college around Amherst, which is one of the most one one of the most leftist areas in Massachusetts, you got Hampshire, you got UMass, you got Smith. Right. These colleges are basically teaching people to be social justice warriors. They're not. I, like I say, when I went to Springfield, I went to Stick. I went to Springfield Technical Community College. Uh, uh, brief, briefly, albeit, but I went to learn a skill, which was broadcasting. Oh, look, I'm doing it. But a lot of these kids are getting, like you say, the money's being transferred from the government to these academics to push a political agenda. Do you agree with that? No, what I'm saying is what we're, the bottom line is what's happening is the children, the millennials are being screwed over by this incestuous educational industrial complex yeah. by people who, who do not understand reality. I mean, I just had a kid just start working for me. You know, we were doing some work and I said, hey, you know, why don't you screw that table? And he didn't know how to use a screwdriver. I said, you ever taken a shop class? He goes, no. I said, why don't you uh, take that uh, cable over there and, and wind it up? He, he didn't even know how to. Wind. I mean, we are getting students who don't have skills anymore. This is completely wrong what we're doing. And what I'm saying is a college education. Look, MIT's education is online, edX, free. Do you really need to go to college? What you really need to do is to learn skills. And that comes from um, connecting small businesses, mentors with young people. I would gladly hire people, pay them something and train them. Give me a tax credit. That's where you learn. When I was 14 years old, I, I invented the first email system. I started working full time at, at a medical school and I learned software engineering. That's what I did. I came to MIT ready to work. I've been working since I was 14, went to MIT, always had a full-time job, bought my first home when I was uh, 20 years old. My point is this, you know, it's apprenticeship, it's mentoring, that's where you learn. We've created this whole notion, you sit in a classroom, you pay a lot of money, you get this paper, and now you're educated. One more, uh, one more, one more quick, one more quick question, and that is, you know, I, I certainly appreciate you being, um, being, being honest. I don't, I don't, I don't think that's going to go over big with millennials, but I appreciate you being honest Not about your platform. Not the entitled ones, anyway. Yeah. Jack, what thumbs up or thumbs down? Thumbs up from Jack. Uh, okay. Well, I don't think it's going to be, but, no, I but, I, but here's the bottom line. Through. I appreciate Look, you being millennial honest millennial about your platform. Through. But one quick question: in the in the Republican primaries, who are you running against, and what can you tell us about the Republican primary? Uh, well, look, the, the Republicans, there's a woman who just uh, announced Beth Lindstrom. She made her life being on Romney's cabinet, uh, made, basically sold lottery tickets. OK, another yeah. guy just threw in two million does. We call him old man Kingston. You know, again, he bought elections for other people, funded elections. And then you have uh, we call this guy Dirty Deal. He said he's a Trump co-chair. Complete lies. He faked a picture of himself photoshopping pictures of shaking hands with Donald Trump. That's the group, all career politicians, all insiders. There we go, Dr. Shiva Ayadore. Boy, running, real for fire, Senate, running for Senate of Massachusetts. Real I got a fiery guy there. <laughs> let, me just, let me just say this. I endorse him. I wicked endorse him. That's what I say. And I'm going with, I'm still, I think I'm, after hearing that, I think I'm sticking with uh, Elizabeth Warren. Well, 
That, that's well, we'll be back Friday. Once we'll a Democrat be... sucker, always a Democrat we'll sucker. We'll be back Monday morning. Gotta go you're with listening the establishment. to Fault Lines with Nixon and Stranahan. <laughs>